In my previous video, I showed how effective duration is really just an estimate or an approximation of a more exact duration that we may not be able to access analytically. So we repriced the bond at two points, computed the effective duration, knowing that that's a pretty good estimate to the more exact modified duration. And then we could think of modified duration as the true measure of interest rate risk associated with the bond. So in this video, I'll use Bruce Tuckman's exhibit, which I've rebuilt, his from table 4.6, where it's a vanilla bond and we do have access to the exact modified duration. And I'll show you how we calculate both the Macaulay duration and the modified duration. The Macaulay duration being the weighted average maturity of the bond and the modified duration being a measure that's gonna be very close to it and is our true measure of interest rate risk. And we'll see that they both, the units of both are years and I'll just confirm it by applying the analytical formula here for the modified duration. So here I've recreated Tuckman's table 4.6 and I've also been faithful to his assumptions. And it's just the first half of the table because I wanna clarify, make sure that we're clear on what bond we're talking about. And then on the next sheet, we'll just add the two columns that compute the duration. And so the bond that he's using has a face value of $100. It has a coupon rate of 2.125% per annum. And we could even give that, it's, that's really a two and one eighths coupon. And we could give it to Excel that way and it would know to convert. And the yield happens to be 2.092% per annum. By yield, of course, we mean yield to maturity. And both of these, by convention, really should be per annum as they are. And right away, when we see the coupon next to the yield, I like, like to remind that we have that rule. When the coupon equals the yield, the bond needs to price at par. And therefore, when the coupon is greater than the yield, like it is here, we want to expect a bond that is priced at a premium. So that's a gut check right on our calculations if we're doing them for an exam. And again, both in per annum terms, although as usual, the bond pays coupons semi-annually. That's more typical. So we have the timeline here and we can immediately see that this is a bond with a five year to maturity. And so we have the stream of future cash flows as usual, right? Face value times the coupon rate, but divided by two because it's paid twice per year. Each coupon is a dollar and 6.25 cents until we get to the end of the bond, the bonds matures, and we also get the final return of the face value, also called the par or principal. The future, the stream of future cash flows is discounted to the corresponding series of present values per the usual discounted cash flow calculation. This indexes all of those cash flows at the same time interval and the cash flow additivity principle allows us to add them together to compute what we would call in this context, the theoretical bond price, because we've used the yield as an input to compute the price. In practice, it's the other way around, right? In practice, we would observe the price. It would trade in the marketplace. So that would be the observed price. That would be the input. And it may trade cheap or rich relative to this price. And then from the observed price, which essentially become the input, we would infer the yield. So. Got a little backwards here as, as an exercise where we assume the yield first. Okay, so we can then go to adding the two columns that Tuckman has for in order to compute duration. And so the way that he does this is computes the time-weighted present value. And you can see I've notated that, right? It's the term times the present value of the cash flow for each row, right? You can see straight away multiplication, although not necessarily intuitive when you first see it, you wouldn't think, oh, multiply the term times the present value. Um, but we do 0.5 times that present value gives the time weighted present value. And then we have a series of those that add to a number that's not intuitive because this is essentially, effectively, this is the dollar duration, or it's really the Macaulay duration version of the dollar duration, but it has that similar kind of magnitude that's not useful to us. But if we sum those together, 
in this case, 477.76. And you can see we can uh, infer that DV01, that's part of his table, really related to the fact that it's a dollar duration by dividing it by 10,000 to rescale it, and then also dividing by 1 plus the yield divided by 2 gives us the dollar, the DV01. That's not my focus here. Rather, it's the Macaulay duration. And having done this here, having sum, sum, summed the time-weighted present value, to get the Macaulay duration, you can see it's very simple. It's a divi it, We divide that sum by the price or theoretical bond price here, right? It's just a division of 477 here by a little bit over 100. And we get 4.7702 years for the Macaulay duration. And when we have the Macaulay duration, you probably know we're just one step away from the modified duration, classic formula here, right? Modified duration equals the Macaulay duration divided by 1 plus the yield divided by k. I'm going to say I'm going to I'm going to remain symbolic here. k is the number of compound periods per year. We're semi-annual, so that's why that's a 2. And so if we are continuously compounding. This goes to infinity. The denominator is one, and that's a special case that are equal each other. In any discrete compounding, right, k is going to be two most likely, but could be 12 for monthly or 250 for daily. We're going to have a k. We're going to have a value that's greater than one in the denominator. And so in any discrete compounding scenario, the modified duration will be slightly left less than the Macaulay duration which is the case here. The modified duration you can see here is 4.7208, also years. The units of these both are years, but our modified duration is the true measure, is the preferred measure of our interest rate risk. That's really the sensitivity measure because by virtue of this compound denominator, it takes into account the effect in, on the current price, where the Macaulay duration is really more the weighted average maturity of the bond. But you can see they're very close. So that is Bruce Tuckman's exhibit and how he gets the Macaulay duration. And now I'd just like to show you a very slightly different approach that is not fundamentally different, but it, that is more intuitive for me and maybe it will help you. And that is going back to the definition here of Macaulay duration as the weighted average maturity of the bond. And so I'm going to define the weights here in a column here where the weights are present value cash flows as a percentage of the price, right? Here's the present value of that first cash flow. And as a percent of the bond's price, I just divide by that total. I'm going to anchor it, right? In that case, it's one. It's a little over 1% such that by definition, the sum of these weights needs to be 100%. Right, so these are then weights, and now I'm just going to weight each of the maturities. See how I'm getting to weighted average maturity of the bond? So I take the weight, multiply by the maturity, and then I sum those, and I get the Macaulay duration of 4.77 years as the weighted average maturity of the bond where we are weighting the maturities by the present value of cash flows as a percent of the bond's price. Now, it's not different at all, right? Because I've divided by price in either way. So mathematically, it's the same math. It's just, for me, this column as weights is more intuitive as a multiplier on the maturities. Why did Bruce Tuckman show it this way? Well, I think the text explains, and that is so that he has this column here that you might have noticed we'd actually didn't use directly into the Macaulay duration. And this column here, again, is time-weighted present value as a percent of the total dollar duration here at the bottom, right? So, for example, 0.11%. Well, this is the contribution to the bond's interest rate risk. 
So my percentages here are merely weights, not directly intuitively useful. This column is here. This column here, if we go down here to the 95.31%, that's telling us this bond's final cash flow contributes 95.3% to the total interest rate risk of the bond. So that column is directly intuitively useful. And so, but either way, you can see this bond's Macaulay duration, its weighted average maturity is a little over 4.77 years. And then just finally, one thing I added here, because in the chapter, he does show us that we do have a tedious but ultimately elegant expression for the modified duration. That's a D here. Sometimes it's a D asterisk, an asterisk to distinguish the modified from Macaulay duration, but sometimes not. We just need to need to uh, look for context for clarity. This is a modified duration as an as a analytical formula if we have the bonds price, coupon, yield, and this is the maturity in this case five years. And so what I've done there is I've just implemented, you can see here, this formula here, just because I did want to check and to make sure that I got the same modified duration. This is a tedious formula. I can't imagine that um, any uh, FRM candidate would realistically want to memorize this formula. It's possible, but you can see you don't need to do that. So that's modified Macaulay duration. And I hope that video is helpful. If it is, please subscribe to the channel and you'll get notified of the next video. And I'll see you in the next one. Thank you.